I think what Jordan just did is he, if I'm not mistaken, no. you just tried to bribe a federal no, officer. No, technically ah, I didn't bribe anybody. No, no, that's technically not the that's no, no, no. Jordan. According to the U.S. Criminal Code, there needs to be an exact dollar figure for an oh. exchange of services that would not hold up in a court of law. No, no, I heard it. No, 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 no. That's the truth. But I want to tell you this. Yeah. The same gentleman that told me that you tried to get your broker's license also told me that you were a straight arrow. He ran a security check on me. Well, you know, when you sail on a boat fit for a Bond villain, sometimes you need to play the part, right? That's a clip from The Wolf of Wall Street. Delighted to say I've been joined by its star, Leonardo DiCaprio. Leonardo, good afternoon, sir. Thank you. Thank you for having me. How are you? Good, yeah. good. Just flew in from, uh, from New York yesterday. Um, we had Martin Scorsese on the show uh, a couple of years back. He's talking about Hugo, and he he said uh, he said on the show it was lovely to do a movie uh, for his young daughter, and he wanted to do a film. He said you start to think like a kid, you know, and it's nice to do something for the kids. Is it fair to say that this is not one of those films, and that he got over that mood fairly quickly? <laughs> I, I would say so. <laughs> I think this is probably his most hedonistic and debaucherous film to date. <laughs> I think that. Uh, Look, this this is the type of film that you rarely see coming from Hollywood. I, I don't. I think you'd be uh, hard pressed to find another film like this in the last ten years or in the next ten years because sort of American epics that uh, deal with the subject matter aren't easily financed. And is it the debauchery that made it difficult to finance, or or what 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 was the problem? Because with you on board and with Martin Scorsese on board, you would think that that would be a straightforward film to finance. Look, I mean, even in my even in my career, there's uh, I, I don't think I'd be able to find the financing for films like Blood Diamond or Aviator right now. Mm -hmm. I think that the the studio system has created a criteria for what needs to happen for uh, large scale epics, and that needs to have a certain amount of explosions, and they need to be uh, you know robots or superheroes. <laughs> but there is, I, I believe, a marketplace for you know adult films like this that sort of explore the 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 darker nature of who we are, and that uh, that deal with you know uh, touchy subjects, polarizing subjects. I mean, this film is is hilarious in a lot of ways, but what we're talking about, uh, the subject matter that we're dealing with, isn't funny. Uh, you acquired the rights for this book seven years ago. What yeah. was it that hooked you in? It was really Jordan Belfort's candid uh, uh, writing. He was incredibly honest and forthright about this time on Wall Street where he gave in to every possible indulgence that he could. And when you, you know, after 2008 and the sort of economic crash that happened, I became more and more fascinating with what it is in our very culture that makes people act this way. And, and the fact that he had an account during his days in the late 80s, early 90s of how he became so obsessed and consumed with... Uh, with greed and power and give, giving into every possible indulgence uh, with, uh, with no sense of embarrassment was, was, was an amazing, it was an amazing account of one man's time on Wall Street. And I wanted to put that up on screen. Um, and in a lot of ways, I think that uh, people have reacted differently to this movie because they, they don't, I suppose they, they expect, you know, the, the protagonist to, to suffer properly at the end of this film, but that's the great irony of this world and this movie is that, uh, you know, he didn't get his proper, these people didn't get their proper punishment. You know, they went on to get bonuses afterwards. So, you know, this, this is a very, uh, it's a very interesting movie in that regard and, and one that I don't know if I'll, you know, ever get the opportunity to do again. Um, is Jordan Belfort's book uh, a confession or is it a boast? I think that, you know, f for me it's a cautionary tale. That that was his main intention with doing this, uh, writing this novel. And that's what his um, life has been like, you know, post-releasing this book. He's tried to do seminars around the world about fair business practice and the, the, the wrong paths that he's gone on and the temptations of, of wealth and being able to essentially live like some sort of uh, R Roman emperor and the, and the pitfalls of Wall, Street's, Wall Street and the, the, the sort of, um, you know, the loopholes that one can find in a financial institution that, uh, 
that allow that is sort of a breeding ground for people that want to take advantage of it and and for him for him writing this book it was you know it was kind of cathartic in a lot of ways he you know he looks at it as um you know you know it's it's not a didactic book it's not something that explains to the audience you know exactly how to feel about this world but it's an honest portrayal of what he went through and 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 that's what was so incredibly attractive about uh, the novel for me and did you know um from very early on that the kind of movie that you wanted to make would not go and dwell on what happened to the victims that it wasn't going to tell their side of the story that we were just going to stay with you was that always the purpose because that's obviously what some people have got upset about yes yeah, so that was incredibly intentional on our on our parts to me the best thing a film can do is immerse an audience into somebody else's mindset. And these people weren't thinking about their victims. They were just a ship that was moving forward, completely consumed with, uh, you know, uh, giving into their own temptations with, without any regard for the repercussions. We didn't want to take a traditional approach to this film whatsoever. Every time we had an opportunity to give the character some sort of false sense of empathy or sympathy, we strayed away from that. And, and, and and f- for me, that was very important because this is something, this attitude is rampant in our culture. This represents something that is incredibly modern to me. And um, and Marty said very early on, if you, if, you, uh, if you don't try to sugarcoat who these people are and their intentions and show them as authentic as le- authentically as you possibly can, then audience will, audiences will go along with you on that journey. And that's what we very intentionally tried to do. And, and the film is, the ending is very ironic in that regard. And like I said, some people are going to get it and some people aren't. I think the word that describes the movie the best, I mean, you've used, you've used some Leonardo, but I wonder if intoxicating is going to work for a lot of people, not just for what you were going through uh, making this movie, not just what Jordan Belfort was going through, but also for us. We, we, in spite of the fact that we don't like you and all the people that you're hanging out with, we go, it, it's hard to loathe you, you know, and mm. we're sort of part of your ride. I think. Marty's done many films like this that I think have been polarizing when they when they first come out. I mean, you go all the way back to Mean Streets. You know, that was a film that was one of a kind when it came out. Nobody would ever seen a film that was that sort of, uh, you know, raw and realistic about uh, the surroundings that he grew up in. I'm I'm not necessarily you know, um, as used to this kind of reaction. But his, I think the uniqueness of him as a filmmaker is that he doesn't judge his characters. Uh, um, you know, no, no matter how disreputable they are as people or um, unlikable, he, he recognizes that there's something about these people within all of us. And he shows this world for what it is in all its excitement and all its glory and all of... Uh, you know all the fun that these people are having, and 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 doesn't shy away from it, and and I think that's admirable. And to me, those are the types of films that that are timeless and live on because they're not a product of of that that time period. Like I keep saying, this this film isn't didactic. It isn't you know when when Public Enemy or Scarface first came out in the 1930s, and they had to put a sort of proclamation beforehand about what you were watching, and sort of spoon-fed to the audience how to feel. You know, uh, you look at it now, and it's 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 completely passe. What you're watching is a product of that time, and you're watching, you know, these actors portray something within these characters that, uh, you know, that that people saw in their culture. And that's what this film is too. It's it is a product of this time and this and our very culture and and the and the economic institutions that that uh, have taken advantage of us. So, have you been surprised by the reaction? That you know, surprised to some degree, but I think a film that's polarizing is exciting too. I mean, uh, a film a film that's somewhat controversial is exciting because I know what our we all know what our that this. This is ultimately a cautionary tale, but we're not going to sort of spoon feed it to an audience and we're not going to pre-digest it for them and tell them exactly how to feel or think. And we're going to be honest about what happened to these people at the end. Is, I don't think I've asked this question before. Um, is filming an orgy one of the more weird things that you get to do as an actor? It is. And it's, uh, 
not nearly as exciting as you think it might be. I imagine it's hilarious. I, mean, I imagine people just are falling about laughing all the time, but I don't know. It, it, a lot, scared, a, a lot of the actors took it very, very seriously, to tell you I'm the sure. truth. <laughs> but if you don't have proper ventilation in that room, it becomes an ab- absolute <laughs> nightmare. No, I mean, it was, it was hilarious, though, because we were on set with a lot of sort of choreograph choreographers and, and dancers that were making love to women and, you know, women that were all over the place with their heinies in the air and... and and everyone was acting incredibly professional about it and, and talking about specifically where their bum should go. And, and it, was, it was absolutely hilarious, but nothing as exciting as one might think it would be like to witness something like that. <laughs> um, and for an intoxicating movie, if we can run with that, would, what was it like when it stopped? Because this had been such a long road for you from, from acquiring the rights for the book, for waiting for Martin Scorsese, and, and then the, the filming of it and getting the financing of it, that, taking place over such a long period of time. When you came off that, what was that like? Well, for me, the, uh, it was the first time I'd ever done three films back to back to back, and I, I did The Great Gatsby, Django Unchained, and then this film, and this film was uh, very much a, an adrenaline dump for me. I, I, I couldn't really imagine doing anything afterwards it it sort of took everything out of me and and that's by the sheer nature of the intensity in which i think we all work uh you know marty set up an environment for all the actors where we could improvise take as many chances as we possibly could every single day was about pushing the envelope and thinking very selfishly you know from a character's perspective you know what do i want what do i need and and feeding those indulgences and it was it was um, it it took a lot out of me, but you know I'm I'm looking for something else now that I could be equally as excited about because, you know, like I said, this film is is not something that you're going to get to see very often, and and um, it was it was very freeing for all of us to be able to do a film that um, where we didn't have to answer to anyone. Um, how did your these characters not die? Leonardo. I mean, the, the, the drug abuse and alcohol abuse, every kind of abuse, is, as, you, as you mentioned, everything is there, everything is on screen. It's amazing that any of them are still with us. That's part of the reason why I wanted to do this movie, because this guy, uh, you know, checked off every possible deadly sin he could and, and, and ended up still standing at the end of it. And, that, and he wrote this novel. Everything that you see in this movie, as insane as it seems and, and otherworldly, really happened to this guy. And, and he survived all of it and, and ended up, ended up um, telling the story. So, yeah, I, I'm surprised, too, that, um, that he's still standing after all I this. I didn't even know what a quaalude was right until yesterday when I saw the movie. <laughs> so uh, did you know what they were? Had, had you come across? Was it, is it an, an 80s, 90s thing? Is it a Wall Street thing? What was that? From my understanding, and I had Jordan Belfort himself uh, roll around on the floor for me to, to, to show me exactly what, being on Quaaludes was like uh, you, you can't get these anymore they're they're outlawed but it's they were surprise. they were heavily abused during that time period and in a lot of ways I think it took the stress off of uh, the you know probably the guilt of what they had to do uh, and and you know the the intense uh, the, you know the, the intense work environment that they lived in I think this is kind of movie that people will go and see and think even if I don't understand high finance and even if I don't understand corporate America or the world globally and I don't understand how businesses run, maybe it gives you uh, an inkling as to why everything crashed in 2008 because everything seemed out of control. I mean, I know this is filmed over a number of years and starts in 87 and so on, but that financial area, when it was unregulated, got into some bad stuff. Yeah. Well, in a lot of ways, you know... It's each generation not learning from the generation before them. And it's almost like a reset button that seems to go on within our financial institutions where people start to make the same mistakes. People find loopholes. They take advantage of those loopholes, and therefore our economy crashes. But what I didn't understand about this movie is, you know, uh, not coming from the world of finance, then having done research on Wall Street, was that these people... Uh, and Jordan and his uh, sort of cronies, they represented something more within our culture. These weren't the guys that were responsible for our economic meltdown. 
Uh, they were a, a, a microcosm of a much bigger story. They were trying to emulate the guys that were really doing it. You know, simultaneously, they were creating a mini Wall Street on Long Island and trying to emulate the, you know, the larger firms while they were simultaneously decimating our economy. But for us, it has to do with the attitude of who they're trying to emulate. <laughs> it has to do with something that's sort of in the very fabric of the world we live in. And, you know, uh, to me, this movie was important and I think very timely uh, because as we're ever expanding, as our economy seems to be surging forward and we seem to be uh, growing endlessly, this attitude is probably the most uh, damaging one that we could have, and it's incredibly destructive. So that's the reason, that was my main motivation for doing this movie, you know, and it seems like a wild, raucous time, but that's, that's, that's the time that they were having. Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, we appreciate your time with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great interview. Thank you.